Okay, hello, um, listeners and viewers. Um, today we are doing a Wireless Wednesday episode on the topic of applications, both financial aid and just general applications. Um, and so I'm joined by Sandra here, who's my co-host on Wireless Wednesdays. Um, and then we also have Mathilde and Tim from the admissions office, and they're going to be telling us about their role with the applications. So Sandra, do you want to, how about we introduce ourselves first? Sure. So I'm Sandra. I'm a senior in international competitive politics. Uh, I started at AUP in spring 19, um, and this semester is my last semester as an undergrad. Beautiful. Um, and I'm Elena. <laughs> I am a junior at AUP, and I'm majoring in history, law, and society, and environmental studies. Um, this is not my last semester at AUP. I still have some time. <laughs> And um, so we're also joined by Mathilde, um, who is the manager of financial aid and recruitment counselor. And we're also joined by Tim Rogers, who has a long title, vice president and director of enrollment management. <laughs> That's it, you got it right. There we, we go. Have, we have a cheat sheet for that. <laughs> oh, let me unmute Mathilde really quick. Um, Tim, do you want to tell us um, about your time at AUP? Yeah, so I've uh, I've worked a long time with AUP, although permanently only for seven years. Um, but prior to that, I was a consultant for about six or seven years before that. So I've seen AUP grow and develop. And at the moment, my kind of day-to-day -day responsibility is the overview on admissions. And I also sit on the leadership team, kind of running the university. Nice. And what about you, Mathilde? Yeah, so my name is Mathilde Fouché, and I am French. The name won't really gives it away. Um, so I've been working at AUP for eight years. 2013 I started, so it's been a while now. Um, and so I am the manager of financial aid and uh, senior recruitment counselor. So I deal with financial aid applications, which we're going to talk about. And for admissions, I basically help students complete their application and help them kind of fill out all the documents to, to apply. And I have students from certain countries that I'm responsible. Thank you. You, Tim, what do you do? Because we know your le your name is most of the time the one we can see at the acceptance letter. So you must have some sort of role of like the finish, giving the finish like approval or something like that. Uh, so what do you exactly do with those applications? A very good observation. It's my signature. Everybody that's accepted and in fact, everybody that's rejected from AUP if uh, oh no. <laughs> is, uh, so it's, you know, come the rough with the smooth. Yes, yeah, so it's my signature on all of the acceptance letters. So, um, of course, in any admissions office, you have, you know, highly qualified and experienced staff who are reading applications. That's, a, that's important to say. So I don't read that many applications these days, but everybody has been trained and we all have an individual approach. Um, but it, we have, you know, uniform standards. So there are obviously criteria by which we judge all applications. And that's true of the team in the US as well as the team in Paris. So one of the, I mean, really wonderful experiences, one of the wonderful aspects of AUP is of course, we really read applications. We are, we are a selective university, but as you two know, it's not a place that you accidentally apply to. So you have made an application because you've done quite a lot of research to work out the kind of place you want to study and AUP either ticks all or some of those boxes. And so what that means is we don't have, you know, you, you hear of the stories, don't you, of the University of Southern California, or um, I noticed this just, uh, just last week, the University of California system having its largest number of applications in history. So we don't have 60, 70, 80,000 applications. We have, you know, for freshmen or transfers, we have maybe 
on a good year, we maybe have 5,000, but generally we have somewhere between three and 5,000 applications. And across the team, we read all of the applications. And I think the beauty of that system is that we don't, you know, the phrase, we don't dial it in. We don't just kind of judge somebody as a machine that's applied, but we read the application in a very individual way. And I, I'm probably not meant to say this, but AUP is a really open place. It's very transparent. And so Mathilde will do this when she talks about applications and particularly financial aid. We'll, we'll give secrets away. So one of the secrets that is really important to AUP is that we have the freedom to read an application and make a judgment about an applicant that doesn't subscribe to any of these data tables or, or rankings like US College and News Report or the World University Ranking. We don't care. What we care about is what an individual can bring to the campus and what they can bring to the classroom and what they can bring to the community. And the, the, I mean, I find it still the most exciting thing about my job. And I know Mathilde feels the same. And I know many colleagues um, across both offices do is that we do not say, you know, none of what we say is you need a minimum GPA of. Mm. We have a minimum GPA because it reflects the quality of the intake, but somebody can be an individual with real passions and prove what they're interested in and have done something really interesting. And they could have a GPA of 4.0 or they could have a GPA of 2.5. And you can only make that distinction if you actually read an application. And so I, I love that approach. And I, I, I think it's, it's one of the great things about AUP that um, you know, we have a colleague who's been reading applications for 20 years and he will still remember some of the individual applications he got 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, because they stood out as an individual. And not many universities can say that. Some universities make selections now based on test results and an algorithm. Um, and I'm not naming names, but that's never going to happen at AUP. <laughs> that's great to hear. I'm glad. <laughs> So shall we start into the heart of the topic and application? So you guys, we're going to share our screen so like that we're literally going to go step by step with you through the application. And we'll ask Mathilde for some input if we, there's some part where like a little bit like, we're not sure what we can, like what we should write or not. So we'll do that. So Elena, go ahead. Okay. Share okay. your screen. <laughs> Let me see if it works this time. Okay. Can you see my yes. screen? Okay, yay. Okay, great. There's my little background of Oregon. That's the that's a financial aid one. Shall we start with the other one? Oops. Thank you for catching that. Okay. So there we go. Perfect. Um, so we're just gonna walk you through each page pretty much of the sample application, and then Matilda's gonna jump in whenever there are um parts that need clarification and things like that. So Right off the bat, Mathilde, do you have any comments about the application or any thoughts? Yes, the first thing is not to be intimidated by it. Um, it's not um, that complicated. It's not rocket science. Uh, everything is about yourself, so you should really know. There's no right and wrong answers. It's not a test. Um, and this is the application on our system. So if you apply on our website, but you can apply um, via the common application as well, which is uh, a site for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, might not go to a US school. Um, it's not exactly similar as, as UCAS for UK students here, but it's a website where you can apply, you can do one application and you send it off to different schools um, that are part of the common application system because the uh, application system for American universities are quite standard. We ask for the same documentation. Um, so it's easily, you can send it off to different schools. Um, so what you see here, it's what you get when you apply on a website, but it's going to ask you the same thing on common application. Mm. And then 
Is this the same application as for graduates and transfers? Uh, it's the same for all undergrads, so transfers, visiting, um, but graduate students have a different application. I mean, it will look similar. We'll ask for the same information about yourself, like name, etc. cetera. Um, but the documentation will ask for transcripts, but they will have different essay questions. And depending on the program they're applying for, because the undergrad app is general to any program you might want to study, any major you might want to do. But for graduate students, it will depend because they have specific program requirement or, you know, thesis proposal to write that would depend on the program. Right. Okay. On to the next page. All right. Let's start. Okay. It's coming up in two. So the one Which is fine. Is the... We'll start with the left one. <laughs> Maybe I can do, there we go. Single page. Okay. Perfect. E. So Mathilde, do you want to kind of guide us through this? Maybe. Yeah. You know? So. It's very standard. We ask you for name, all of the red fields are mandatory. So if you if you don't fill one out, it will not let you save and go to the next one. We get that question a lot, why won't it save? Um, so just general information about you, where you're from, where you're born, citizenship. Um, sometimes students ask, um, should I apply as a, a US student or an international student? Um, it, the same. It, it's, we don't have separate applications. With um, students from over 100 nationalities, there is no, there are no distinctions. Okay, so we ask for where you were born and your countries of citizenship and where you are right now, which could be three different things um, for students. So we just ask you. It helps us um, get you the right admissions counselor because you'll have a dedicated admissions counselor based on where you're from. So that's what we ask all of those questions. Um, and so just gen generic, generic information really on this page. Okay, great. On to the next. Okay, I'm gonna okay. go well, For this one, we're actually, both of us, Elena and I, we didn't struggle because that's a big word, but we both were in the situation, what do you do if you only have one parent? Yeah. Or that's, so that was definitely a big thing for us. Yeah, that's valid. Well, if you look under relation, you can't see the drop down here, but you see under parent one or parent two, you have relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you have different options. It doesn't have to be your mom or your dad. It can be, you know, legal guardian here. We have that. It can be someone else. And so the relationship in there, we have options for um, like no contact with this parent. It says a drop down option. Okay. Um, and we also have inf we also have um, the option deceased, unfortunately, if students are in the situation. So we don't have to enter information to that. To that okay, parent. so at least you don't get blocked even if it's a mandatory relation, you don't get blocked, you can move forward with no prime. Yes. That's good, that's good to know. Yeah. Great, thank you. Is there anything else on this page that you want to know? Um, no, so um, something that uh, sometimes students get confused, it's a permanent home. We have students sometimes that study in another country, they go to a boarding school. So in their current address, I would put the address you're currently in, so they put the address of the school. Permanent home is sometimes, most of the time where your parents are. Um, okay. And those can be two different things. Um, I would say we also have military families um, that sometimes have a different permanent home than their current address, so they will use this um, as well. Okay, great. Okay, on to the next page. So, yeah. academic interest. <laughs> so That's it, getting into the art of the thing. <laughs> So first we ask about financial aid and scholarships. This is just to indicate if you're interested, if you want to apply for AP financial aid, uh, because uh, the system then will send you the application. So it's a way to indicate. So we don't actually, we don't take that into account. We don't take your financial aid need in the application process. So we're completely, this completes two separate process. We don't, you know, some schools will, um, consider the fact that you're applying financial aid as an admissions decision. We don't. Oh, okay. We, so we don't consider need or ability to pay or something in your admission in the admissions decision. It's only your admissions file and your information, your academics and profile. But asking you this will help us to send you the application that we're going to talk about later. So you get it and you can um, complete it. And for our American students, it helps us because we know you might also consider loans. So we send you information about that as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the program information, it's because we're curious, uh, because really, if you know the American system a little bit, um, you don't apply for a specific program. So in France, in Europe, in the UK, um, you apply to a program. You go to that school to study economics. Um, in the US system, you apply to a university, uh, but you don't necessarily apply to a specific program. So you can tell us you're interested in economics, but then you come to AUP and you decide to major in art history. It's totally fine. We won't, you know, remind you that you chose that in the application system. Um, so it's also a way for us to send you information about that major um, or see your interests. Sometimes it relates to some stuff that you've done and we'll see in your kind of extracurricular list. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not binding. So students don't need to worry about whatever they put there is not set in stone. They can change it at any moment. Exactly. And undecided is an option. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I, I remember putting that option. <laughs> I didn't have the luxury as a transfer. I kind of had to pick. I was already like full max of transfer credit. Yeah. So I had to pick something. Yes, as a transfer student, uh, you, you kind of have to decide not necessarily at the time of application, but if you're admitted and you have a kind of a, an advising, an advising appointment before registering, you kind of have to decide what you want to do. But most transfer students know. What exactly. Want. It's not really a, a secret or a big question mark. Yeah. Oh, okay, on to the next page, which is education information. Yes, uh, so this is important. This is for us to know where you go to school, <laughs> where you went to school, because we need the past three years of transcripts. So we need, you know, high school information, college information, because those are also for transfer students. Um, and transfer students can transfer a maximum of two years, and we ask for the past three years of credit. So that's what they will also have a high school information for them. But you see, the college information is not mandatory because if you're in high school, you don't have to complete that. Um, and we do ask for the name because we have relationships with schools. So we like to see um, where students come from um, and when you started at the school. Um, and when you, you know, are graduating or to date, because some students have moved a lot and they've attended three different high schools. Um, so you will have the option to add another school as well. You see at the, the bottom on the right, you can add as many high schools that you went to. If you change three times, you can add three high schools. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. So I, I'm French. I forgot to say that at the beginning. So high school is very different than in the US. We don't have transcript per se. You collect all your transcript at the end of high school and sometimes you lose it. That's my case. So how, what happened like if, if that's the case and there's no recollection of anything like do you have solutions or does it get tricky? Well, it gets tricky if you don't have anything. Uh, we still need your transcript. So um, technically, we need, we need officials, but we need official transcripts coming from your school. At the application level, we don't need the official coming from the school. You can, you can scan your transcript. Um, if you're admitted, then we'll need it. It's part of you know, our accreditation in the US. We need to have all of the originals. Now, we know that in some countries, you don't get, schools don't send it. Um, I went to French high school, a French university. They don't and I worked in a French high school and I know they have the record. I know they have the transcript because I was the one photocopying all of the transcripts of the <laughs> high school, all the students and filing them in a cabinet. So I know that they have them, but they won't send it. Um, so it's up to the student to, and it's written on our, all of our French transcripts to hold on to them forever and ever and ever, because you won't have copies. Um, if you lose them completely, I'm sure the school sometimes, especially if, you know, you, you graduated not so long ago, will we'll maybe give you a copy. They won't send it to the school, but maybe they'll give you a photocopy of it, which is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, and you can just scan them and upload them um, as well. We're familiar with a different school system. We, we're used to that because of the, the nationalities of our students. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, here we have standardized test scores. Yes, well, it's a little foreign for a student who didn't study like me in the U.S. in high school. Yeah. That was, what is that? What do you want me to give you? It's very American. Um, yeah. Elena, I don't know if you took some tests. If you, if you oh, I took plenty of tests. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're optional with AP. So 
So that's why this page is not mandatory, as you can see, there are no right fields. Um, we're test optional, we've been test optional for a long, long time. A lot more schools are getting test optionals right now in the US because of COVID and the situation and students not being able to go to test centers and do tests. Um, it doesn't really tell us at AUP the full story of a student because it's a very American test. Um, they're like math, writing, it's a bit, yeah, I'm not even, I, I know what they are, but I'm not 100% familiar with them because we don't, we don't require them. And the students that I handle are, don't usually take the, the test. Um, so students are welcome to submit test scores. That's why it's there if they want to, if they you know, took tests for other schools and they really um, had really good scores or they, they want to submit it, anything you want that can enhance your application, go ahead. Um, but if this page is left blank, this is not going to raise alarm bells. <laughs> We're like, well, what happened there? It's totally, totally optional. Um, and for students, I've seen students from France, uh, I help French students take taking ACTs because they're applying to schools in the States and they don't do well, but they have great grades at school. They do well in their local school, but they don't, you, you're you being prepped, right? And then I'm sure you got the, the prep in grade 11, you took yeah. the like, Mm -hmm. PhD and you got all the classes to get ready for it. Kids in other schools don't get that, which, you know, make it that you don't, you're not as successful. So it's totally optional there, not, not all required. That's good news. I think I actually re remember submitting my SAT score and then I was like, nope, I don't want to put that on there. And I emailed <laughs> someone in admissions and they were like, don't even worry, we took it right off. And I was like, great. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to be the main deciding factor, even if you do put them in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we get that question a lot. I think you do too, Sandra, on the tours when we do campus tours. Yes, definitely. And I'm, I'm always like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I never do the SAT. So I'm like, I know you don't have to submit them, but I have no idea how we can influence. So I'm like, just as a counselor after you, you we're done with the tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the number one concern because even non-American students will have heard of ACTs, I don't know, in TV shows or somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. they always talk about it. And they know that it's something that students do that you need to get admitted to American universities. So they're worried um, when they visit us because we're an American university, but yeah, totally optional. And, mm -hmm. and actually a lot of schools in the US, even before COVID went test optional for international students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, on to the next page, recommendations. Yes, so we need two letters of recommendation from um, professors, from teachers. So we like it to be from teachers, um, especially if you're in high school or college, you have access to your professors. Um, so, I mean, because sometimes students send, you know, the, the coach, recommend for the coach or the piano teacher. I mean, it is, it is good because they, they are still teachers, but we like to see in an academic setting because the idea is for students, is for us and the, the admissions committee to know how you act as a student. So um, those can be in French and in English. So something we didn't mention, um, all of this can be in French. Uh, except for what we're going to talk about later, the essays that you're writing. But uh, if you go to a school that is, you know, or you want your French teacher to, to, uh, to write the reference and your French teacher is more comfortable writing in French, um, they can do that. And uh, it's absolutely no problem. Uh, and so we also know that in some schools, it's not because the question I have a lot from international students that go to local schools, not, not international schools or anything, but local schools is they're not used to writing letters of recommendation, like at all. And uh, and the standard letter of recommendation from French teachers, um, so it's not a critique on the French, but I'm French, so I know, I know how they write. I see a lot of applications from France and um, they just don't know what goes in there. So they write like, Elena was present at my, class and she's very nice and um, she's always on time they're really they're really uh, passionate about being on time um we don't hold it against you um we know you're not writing the letter of recommendation it's best if you choose a professor that you know so if you engage in some kind of like after school activity or project with that professor 
in maybe a club, uh, maybe that would be better to choose that professor because he or she will have more to say um, about, about you. Um, but yeah, choose a professor that, that you know will be able to write quite a lot about you if it's class that you participate. I remember I did that. One of my recommendation letter was one of my teach my economic teacher, and then he was also the supervisor for the business club we I was part of. And my other one was a professor that I never had in class, but she was my tutor. So my previous school had tutoring made by professors or retired professors. So she was my English tutor. So um, she definitely knew me well on that one. She had struggled with me <laughs> to get me to an academic standard in English. So that's, I remember it was my two choices. So what about you, Elena? Did you pick professor as well? I, I'm trying to recall and I just, huh. Yeah, I, I, I think I did. I don't remember who they were though. And I think one of them was actually my, um, my counselor, my high school, you know, like university counselor, um, college counselor. Um, yeah, I don't remember my, my recommendations to be honest. But um, Mathilde, I was wondering this uh, wave access um, mm -hmm. section. Can you explain what that what that yeah, is? I have to put my glasses on. I can only. So this has to do, it explains it right here. It has to do with FERPA, which is um, uh, an American, you know, regulation and that we have to buy, buy. So after, if you are accepted in your role at AUP, you may request to view your recommendation. So the recommendations are not sent by you. The teachers don't send it to you and you send it to, the, um, uh, to us. Uh, what students do, you see here, you enter um, on the next box, you enter your professor's name, email, mm -hmm. and it will send your professor a, a request. You can warn the professor ahead of time saying, hey, do you mind writing my recommendation? And so the professor will receive an email and uh, they'll be able to submit it directly. Sometimes it, it doesn't work somehow. It can come directly in an email. It's okay. Your counselors can collate collect those recommendation letters and send it to us. But the students don't usually see that. It's not meant for you to see. Um, so we, this, this regulation is that you're, uh, you're allowed and entitled to see it um, and uh, unless you waive your right to do so. So it's just kind of a, an authorization for us to know because we have to comply by proper regulation. Mm, okay us to make sure that we respect that rule. That makes sense. And how many, um, with the recommendations, how many should students submit? Two. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Next page then. Well, next page, no, go back okay. up. Next page is on the same page. <laughs> transcript, yeah, it's part of transcript. Yeah, it, it goes hand in hand with the, the next page. Um, so transcripts, we ask for the past three years, like we said, for the high school education. Um, so we'll ask for, you know, usually you're applying, you're in grade 12 or your final year or grade 13 if you're in the UK or 10 now if you're in France. So you'll apply in your last year of high school and uh, you don't have transcript for that year, except, you know, if you have your first trimester or semester grades of grade 12, you can submit those and then the past three years. So yes, it does include grade 10, I always say that in my presentation when I used to be allowed to go to school and present. Um, and students, I could see the face, the faces and the, the, the sheer panic. Of, um, it's okay. We are not going to hold you to that scene. Great. Okay. Um, but professors, professors like that, though, we make that distinction because it's important, it's important to know that what you did overall count. And that's what I like in our system. Like Tim said, we're reading applications. We're reading your past three years of grades. We don't look at the GPA and make a cut. We don't look at your first trimester of grade 12 GPA where anything could have happened. Look at this year. Mm -hmm. You do remote, work, remote learning and, and anything. So it's important to see the overall because if we only do like one trimester GPA or your final year, well, if when things like what the world we live in right now happen, 
kind of, you know, it's not, it's not the truth or reflects the reality of a student. So we're going to look at the progression. If you progressed, again, maybe grade 10, it's grade 10 is the first year of high school for a lot of students in non-American schools. So it was hard to adjust, but grade 11 grades are better and you progressed. And we see sometimes students are better at some topics than others. I personally would have been the one with, like, I would have liked for AP to look at the social science side of it, not the science side of it. Um, so we look at all of this, it's important. So we don't just look at your cumulative GPA calculated by your counselor on the transcript. You have to look at like at everything, so. Mm -hmm. And what I get this question a lot too, what can you do if you feel like your transcript doesn't represent your academic capabilities? Or if maybe like you said, there was a rough year, maybe like you had mm -hmm. some sort of family incident and it, it, it's reflected in your grades. How can you kind of like justify it? Yeah, it happens. And um, there is a space here. I mean, that's where the letters of recommendation can come in handy. Um, if you have a guidance counselor at your school, or like a, a professor that's kind of your advisor, uh, maybe it's best to ask that professor, that counselor to write one of the letters where the professor can explain what happened. And it happens a lot that we see some kind of um, something happened there and uh, we go back to the, or we go to the letter of recommendation, depending how the person reading the application kind of go through the material. Um, and it, it is explained in their letter of recommendation. And that's helpful. We've had students with difficult situation with um, illness in the family or the student um, himself or herself going through a difficult time where they, it was hard to cope with studies. And it explains sometimes for, you know, dip, dip in grade. Um, so it's important. And as the student yourself, the, the common application has that, but we, we have it too. And, and you can always submit an additional document. That's why you have your personal, personal admissions counselor that can help you because you can contact that person and say, hey, listen, I'd like to add a document. And we can add any document in there for the admissions committee to read um, that would explain something. So. It's, it's a personalized process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. a recurring theme of the application. <laughs> okay, now the next page. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. gosh, all the supporting documents. So yeah. that's something as well, like as a French student, for me it was transfer. So I had like the previous grade to help, but like, what do you do for English proficiency, proficiency test? All notes. Yeah. Not all students do a TOEIC or TOEFL or whatever else they might be. So what do you do for that? Well, you have to take a test. Okay. So if you go to an international school, you go to an American school, not in the US, um, if your, your high school is entirely in English, even if it's not in an English speaking country, you don't have to take a test. You don't have to provide a test result. If you're doing the IB program entirely in English, um, you don't have to take a test. But if you go to your local schools in your country, you're doing the French BAC or the Abitur in Germany, or you go to an Italian school and you're not studying in English. So you, you're taking English class, but your other classes are in your local language. You will have to submit an English test. So it can be the TOEFL, the TOEIC, the IELTS. Uh, lots of students mostly take the TOEFL because it's easily accessible in most countries. It could be the Cambridge exam. Um, lots of French schools now have organized Cambridge exams with the English professors, so that's totally fine. Uh, I know that this year, due to the whole situation, the TOEFL has moved online, so that was really helpful for the students okay. because it is on the computer anyway. I took the TOEFL many years ago, and uh, <laughs> I went to a very big test center in Paris, and I sat in front of a computer, uh, and I did the test in front of a computer in a room with 20 people um, who were doing the speaking part while I was doing the writing part. Oh, no. Uh, so you can, you can really easily do it online. So I think they find a way to do a, a proctored exam while you're at home. So that was really helpful for the students. That is helpful. Um, so yeah, English test is very, it, it's important for us um, because the way uh, schools teach English is different. You don't teach English the same way in France and Germany and Italy. Um, the level of a student, you know, it's not the same school by school. So this allows for some equality as well, because they are, the test is the same everywhere you take it. So it will help us to know if you 
will be successful. Because while we do have English classes, everybody takes English classes, even Elena took English classes, um, college level, you know, writing in English, mm -hmm. but we have different levels for that. Um, but we don't have, you know, learning English. You need to be able to do the courses in English and we don't want you to set, up, to set you up to fail. So we, you need to have a good level. So we sometimes have students that have a great file, but the English is not great. And so sometimes we go to them and we say, listen, you're admissible. We would love to have you here, but you have to go work on your English for a semester a year, and then you come back with new scores. That's cool. And um, now if we pass to number two, like extracurricular, I get some mouthful for me, yeah. that thing. <laughs> plus so the activities and everything um do you have like a recommendation like how detailed should it be like do we should should we just mention a few things and then there's something that doesn't really need to be there because you're not going to very focus on them or should you put every single things because i looked at mine and there was like literally two page long i was like that was maybe a little over <laughs> No, some students have two page to three pages. Um, it depends also on how accessible those things are to them. Um, so American students tend to have very long, very long uh, lists because they have access to lots of things at school. Um, my French students less so uh, because it's not a big, you know, big clubs in school is not big. So they have stuff they do outside. So I think having a short description of each activity is interesting, especially if you took on a leadership role. Um, it's good to say what you did, because we might not be familiar with what that club is at your school and how it works. So if you undertake some, undertook some big project, it's good to put it in there. You don't have to like write an essay about it, but just two or three lines, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, if you do as a hobby, if you take dance lessons, you don't have to give a description, but for clubs and stuff, it's, it's really interesting. And it doesn't have to be like a resume or a CV. You don't have to put your education. We have that from before. So it could be just a list of the things you do with short descriptions. It's really to know who you are outside of being a student from your grades. So for now, we looked at your grades, we look at your letters of recommendation, but nothing as you as the person. Mm -hmm. And this is where we can see you as a person, what you like, what you do. And it gives us an idea of how you're involved you'll be um, on campus and your interest and how you can match, you can find those interests at AUP as well. I guess for me, matches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're involved in lots of clubs. Uh, I you know. know, that's why I was like, it, it, it matches. <laughs> oh man anyway all right so um the essay part so we they you guys asked for two essay one more general and there's a choice of topics like five and then one more aup centered um for the general one like before we go into the greedy detail could you maybe talk to us about one a member of one you read like something just give us like, of course, we don't want any names or anything like that, but maybe like what it was about or something. Like, just to give some example, because sometimes I remember this one, I'm like general is so general that sometimes it's hard yeah. to find that little sparkle, like who make a great yeah. idea. Yeah, they're general questions because they're the same topics as on the common application, like I mentioned at the beginning. And because you can send that application on coming up to multiple schools, the essay has to be um, kind of generic about you. So it's not like, why do you want to study this at AUP? Um, and so you see, I don't know if they still have it because um, they changed the subjects, but the, the essay that I really liked, the student had chosen the topic. Tell us about um, a moment where you went from childhood to adulthood, mm -hmm. kind of that defining moment. Um, and I really didn't know where she was going with that. <laughs> because it started with, she was moving. Uh, so I don't know all the details, but I, she was moving and it was, you know, we get a lot of those stories at AUP because students are very mobile with their parents, etc. So I thought it was going to be the general essay about being a global explorer, which is great because um, we have a lot of them at AUP. And um, I was like, okay, it's a good essay, it's well written. Um, 
but it was all about how she panicked because she had left something behind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't know why she doesn't, she doesn't she, what, she doesn't tell you what in what it is. And um, then she learned that her parents on purpose left it behind. Oh. Um, and she was talking about her little childhood blanket that oh. she had and how she left it. And for her, that was the moment that she learned separation and how she, you know, decided that she, she grew up, that mm -hmm. she learned to live without it. So it was part of her childhood she left behind. And That's I thought nice. it was very clever and I really liked it because it was a twist on the mm -hmm. traditional and moving essay. Yeah, and there's so many good, good ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly creative. <laughs> there are no bad essays, okay? Like, I get that question a lot. And sometimes I do workshops with at schools about how to write the essay. And mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have time to go into detail, but the students are like, what's the, like, the good topic? Like, what should I talk about? There are no wrong, you know, there are no bad topic. You can make anything interesting. That's why I tell students. If you choose... Don't try to please us by choosing a topic we think we would like or what we want to hear about. Um, you can make it, you can make any topic interesting if you're interested in it and you find a creative way to write about it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, and then moving on to the AUP specific essay question. Is there, can you give, the listeners any tips is there anything that they should try to include in there if they can narrow down their topic yes um so that's where it uh is less generic so if you apply on the common app you you might have an additional essay or something based on how many schools you're applying to so i know some schools do q a like a questionnaire about yourself and um us we ask for a shorter essay and it's it's why AUP, so again, it's not a school essay or rocket science. I would say we really like when we see the student, students um, have done their research mm -hmm. about AUP. Um, so look at our online, at our website. Some students decide to talk about a specific club or what they want to, um, what they want to do at AUP, how it relates to how they lived. So, you know, being a global explorer, um, some students, Say because it's in Paris. I would say if you decide to go that route, try to be um, a bit creative or related to something in your experience because we do get that essay a lot because <laughs> I like Paris, etc. Which is not a bad reason, um, but like Tim said, we have 5,000 5, applications a year. So um, you might want to, to be a bit more creative. I think we do like when we see an interest in AUP specifically which can be part of it as a location. Absolutely, let's face it. Um, I mean, it's part of the name, after all. It's part of the name, it's in Paris and lots of students come here for Paris and it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, but I say when you also add a little bit about how you see yourself here, how you see yourself mm -hmm. fitting in, are you, what you will make of it, it's mm -hmm. interesting for us to see. Yeah, sort of how you envision yourself adding it. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think then if Sandra, we don't have any more questions, we can move on to the financial aid application. Yeah, that will be faster because there's only a few things. It's just like, so don't worry guys, we're almost done. <laughs> I can go faster on the financial aid app. Okay. Full screen, let me do single page. Okay. Here, Here we, we are. Right. So those information are really like much the same one than the application one. The only thing here is you um, you ask a little bit more onto the parents detail, like, but I think that comes to the next part, the next page. Um, what happened? So for me, the main, maybe the main question is again, you are, I can see parents too is not read anymore, so that's great. And but what happens if you are a graduate student? Like, do you still need to do yeah, that so, parent thing or not? So the application here is the application for undergraduate students. The application okay. for 
graduate student will ask the same information afterwards for the same, but the labeling of things would be different. So we don't ask for parent one, parent two. We ask for students' information. Okay. Um, and we ask for what we call a financially responsible person. Mm -hmm. And students have, it's not mandatory, but students have the opportunity to put in there, if a parent is contributing to their education and is present and is helping, then we'll ask for financially responsible person information. Okay. Um, so parent two, you might have independent undergraduate student, that happens. Um, independent by US regulation is, um, is uh, 24 or older, um, or if married or something. So, in here, we can also adapt it. You don't have to put, same with the status and relationship of the parent. You have the option to say deceased, you have the options to say limited information on that parent. Um, and so for when we come to the next page where we ask for income information, you can always put zero. Um, okay. And give us information on what your situation is. We have we had students in the past that were not independent by age, but they were married or emancipated and uh, obviously then they enter their own information and, and we can tailor the, the application for them. So, so quite, it's, it's, um, ooh, I don't know what that was that. <laughs> so to resume, if there's a doubt, they can just contact the, the academy, the, the counselor, uh, the admission counselor, and you guys can help them figure it out what's the best option for them. Yes. Okay, great. That's great. So I think we can go to the next page. Just a general question really quick. Um, when students are applying for financial aid, is that financial aid based on need and scholarships? Yes, good point. So financial aid at AUP is based on merit and need. So we this is to apply for a scholarship for financial aid. It's The terms are very mixed depending who you're talking to because in the US, as an American school, I have to speak as an American school, but I also speak as a French person. And financial aid can mean also federal loans, US loans for US students, which is a possibility for them. Because even the Department of Education talks about loans in the terms of financial aid sometimes. Um, and um, it's at AUP, it's, we have a specific application, which is what you're looking at. That means that you can receive help from AUP. So you get, effectively a discount on tuition, that's what it is. So you will get maybe uh, 5,000 a semester scholarship, which means that you'll pay 5,000 less on your, um, and that's what it is, that's the application for it. And we base it up the, the merit, and merit is evaluated with the admissions file, so the application we just went through, uh, and also the need, which is what we're looking at with this application. So it's a com combination of both, and it's also not an algorithm. Uh, it would be easier, save us time, but it wouldn't be fair. Um, so we read all of the financial aid applications the same way we read all of the admissions applications. And we pay attention to all the details um, of a specific situation. So that's why no, no two students have the same financial aid and shouldn't compare each other because situations are very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for covering that. Okay, on to page two, financially responsible person. I think we covered that, right? Yeah, yeah. so for, for undergrad, it's there because sometimes the parents are not the financially responsible person. Um, we ask for parents, but sometimes this, uh, some students live with their grandparents and it's the grandparents taking care of them. So this is an option for them if they're in this, uh, that situation. Mm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so much red. <laughs> so red, hey? yeah. It's scary. <laughs> we revamped it last year and I made everything red. Yeah. Um, it's okay because you can always enter zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do ask for, that's where we establish need. So we look at, um, you know, the need of the, uh, of the family by looking at the income of the family. Mm -hmm. um, so first we ask for currency, so if some parents are paid in foreign currency, so we ask um, if you're paid in dollar to fill it out in dollars, if you have any other currency to convert it into euros, um, that helps us, so we don't have to do the conversion. Uh, and we ask for, we ask families to think, because the big question we have here is this year and next year. 
<laughs> what does that mean? Um, and it means that we ask you to think in terms of not just one year, because you're going to be here for more than one year. Mm -hmm. So we're just asking families to think about that. It's okay if it's not exact for next year, and it's not necessarily academic year, it's calendar year for parents, obviously, um, what they know, but it's also a way for them to, to see what to plan financially. And so we ask for income, and you see, you can enter zeros if you want. Not all families have rental income or alimony or other incomes. So just enter zero, and that's fine. The form will not save if you don't enter anything. So just enter zero. Um, and so the same, we ask for savings. Savings is the only one where you can't enter zero, but you can just enter one. Um, <laughs> we're just because we assume that families sometimes have some kind of savings that they might have put towards their children education. So we ask for that. But we also ask for debt. Some parents sometimes have student loans or car debt or home. Um, so we do pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. That's all great information. Um, next page. Oh, it's a continuation. It's continuing about the real estate. So we just ask if parents, you know, they might have a mortgage or they have rent to pay. Um, and because we factor that in as well. Great. Okay. There we go. Student financial information. Yeah. So we also ask for students info because sometimes students have their own savings. So that's maybe their parents have opened some kind of savings account for them when they were younger and they are going to put that towards their education. And some students, unfortunately, sometimes already have debt or become as transfer students. Or, so we do factor that in. So we try to have the like, comprehensive the picture. view. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, next page. Family dependents. So they are your brothers and sisters <laughs> or your parents' dependents. So it's not mandatory. You know, your parents might not have other dependents. So you shouldn't include yourself in there. Um, but maybe your parents are also paying for another college tuition, mm -hmm. um, university tuition for another child they have. Or they are, you know, some families sometimes enter uh, grandparents in there. Um, in some families, grandparents live with the parents or they care for them by paying. So, of course, there is name of school. You wouldn't fill that out, but you might do amount provided by family um, because some parents provide money to elderly parents or who pay them for their care or medical bills. So mm -hmm. they can really enter all that information there. But we do take into account when you have three children, two of them in college, maybe one in private school. It, you know, it makes sense for us because you can have a high income, but then you have all this um, um, charges that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Financing your education. Yes. It is the same idea. We ask you to plan and to think. Um, so at AUP, the maximum financial aid we um, offer is 50% off of tuition. We do have an award of 75% called the AUP Scholar that all students who apply for this financial aid um, is considered for. You don't have to do a specific application and they're for students with really high need, demonstrated high need, and also very high academic um, capabilities. Or, um, so we do consider everybody for that. But at this point in time, we don't have a 100% scholarship. So we ask students to think about how they will finance what is not covered by financial aid. So for those students, it might be family contribution or student contribution. Students will use like their college savings account um, or they might use loans. So that's where we have an other sources there because they're um, in, you, in the US you have loans, but in some countries do you have student loans? And, um, Sweden, you have a specific government scheme for students they can finance their education with. And so it's uh, also for us to know that you've planned for this. And then we ask you for how much financial aid would reasonably help. And this is a drop down where you have different brackets um, for that for, for AUP. And it's totally fine if you put the maximum um, that, that would help. That's something important to say, because, for example, my mom, when I first applied, she didn't want me to say that I needed help because she was like scared that I wouldn't get accepted because I was not able to pay for the tuition. And so I think it's important to say that it's not because you won't be able to pay for the full 15, 16 um, thousand for the semester that you shouldn't apply to AUP because there's all those help that 
or here, we can make it work. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So your mom has the the French parent reaction. Definitely. It's the French parent syndrome. She was like, um, you can't uh, pray for it. They're never going to accept you. <laughs> I deal with a lot of that when I do information sessions for French parents because it's not, um, that's not how scholarships work in, in, in France. It's only based on need uh, and it's an algorithm. It's, it's a grid based on income. So there's a bit of that apprehension. But like I said at the beginning, this part you can do it, you can fill out the two applications at the same time. You can do the admissions application at the same time as the financial aid application. Mm -hmm. But the two never cross paths. So the person reading your admissions application doesn't have access to this application. Mm -hmm. I have access, the director of financial aid, Randy has access, uh -huh. but the person reading the application will see that you ticked yes to scholarships and loans. But won't know but the extent. Yes, and a lot of students will not have completed the financial aid application by the time that their applications for admissions is being reviewed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fine because the way it works is you first receive your congratulation email. You've been admitted to AUP, hopefully, and then you receive your admissions on financial aid. We only review financial aid decisions for students who've been admitted. Um, so there's no risk of it um, <laughs> because... Uh, some schools are need aware of how they call it, so they will, you know, consider that. It's not an AUP, so you can definitely apply. Now, we tell students to consider our tuition and that we help and we can help up to a certain point, you know, mm -hmm. for students. But this is not, yeah, it's no, your, your mother didn't have to, to worry about anything because that's not how it works. Because let's face it, most students need help to pay tuition. So it wouldn't really be, work very well if we were doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you wouldn't have that many students. <laughs> if yeah. it was the only student who could afford everything, that would like shrink the yeah, number. That's not, that's not fair. We don't want only students who can afford. That's not how it works, you know? No, we, exactly. it, it's about um, diversity of, of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Next page. Additional information. What kind of things would go here? So it's, uh, you don't have to fill it out. Some students leave it blank sometimes or say nothing to add. But this is really, uh, uh, it's there to give us any information that you might think we need. Like you said, Elena, for the admissions app, what if I want to add um, anything to it? Uh, to my admissions app because I don't think my transcript reflects my capabilities. It's the same. See, we ask for numbers and we ask for documents. We'll, we'll talk about it next, but they're numbers on a form. Mm -hmm. And so we, and you only have access to kind of the past year, you know, of information. So it's there to tell us exactly what's happening. You right. know, you might have put two parents in there, but actually one of your parents is not contributing. Mm -hmm. or some families have difficult situation or um, there's a situation where a divorce is happening or things you want to tell us that you couldn't explain with numbers on a form that you want to tell us. This year, lots of students are taking advantage of this um, box because the, their situation changed a lot, obviously, with what's going on. So um, they're giving us documents and figures for 2019 or 2020, the beginning of 2020. And since then, they've been parents have um, had their hours reduced or situation changed. And so this is important. And we, we read it and we take it into account. Um, sometimes, yes, students will say, well, uh, you know, there's no dependent per se but uh, my sister graduated college, but it's hard to find a job. So just leaving at home, my parents are providing mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Right. I, I remember my mom had actually broken her back the year before I applied to university and that like changed our income for that year. And I remember using that. Yeah. Um, she's fine now, by the way, but um, <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify, but I remember using this field to, to explain that whole thing. 
I definitely use that field too to explain like the change of income from one year to the other because you have that set year, but then I knew the next year will be different. But to express that in numbers is hard. So it was good to be able to give more more detail mm -hmm. on there and be like, something is coming. <laughs> yeah, and we do in fact read it. So use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right, supporting documents. Page. I think that's the last page on the sample, but if you want to talk yeah. about supporting documents and things like that. Yes, because the, the, the next page is blank because it's a place to upload your supporting documents. And so an application won't be considered complete until you upload documents. So it will stay at our 0% uh, in our little um, system okay. where we ask for the, what it will say in there is we ask for income statement and tax return. Those have different meanings around the world. Um, and so the number one, it's not a problem, but the number one um, question that we get uh, is, well, we don't have that in my country. <laughs> and you can replace it with whatever you want. Um, another document, it could be bank statement. Um, it could be that in your country, you have one document. So we ask for two documents, but it could be one document with all of the information Mm -hmm. at once in your country, it's fine. It could be 10 documents, it's fine. What we want is the complete picture. We mm -hmm. want to be able to understand um, what your situation is. And so, you know, we want to see it match what you told us in the application. So uh, for the uh, American students, the tax returns are tax returns, but income statement could be a payslip or it could be W-2 forms. They have that at the end of the year. Um, in France, it's your bulletin salaire you get every month. Um, and it, but in some countries, there are countries you don't pay taxes, so they don't have tax returns. It's fine, you can submit some, something else. Sometimes income statements will have the taxes there because it's um, withheld with their income. So it is something that is not set in stone. It's not a box that you tick because you can give us the right document, but if they don't say anything, we might come mm -hmm. back to you saying, hey, listen, can you submit something else? Mm -hmm. um, and counselors really follow that as well. So they don't have access to the application in the sense they, they don't read it, but they do get um, a report and they, they can see it in our system that the application is not complete. So they will come to the financial aid team and say, hey, what's missing? What my student, what, you know, my students said that, what else can, can the student give? Mm -hmm. And so we tell them to, to kind of submit some other documents. So it's open, it's pretty open there um, as well. We can arrange it. And for, for the document, if we have some document that won't be fitting perfectly, like what they asked, but would work, should we even ask, add something into the additional information? Should we add like, okay, I, I'm gonna give you that document because in my country, I don't have that. So this should be working. Yes, you can. Yeah, absolutely. That way it will help us understand why you submitted those and it will avoid some back and forth. Other question. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. And then I see we have a last part, which is called charge and additional items. What is that? Um, to be honest, <laughs> no, I'm sure. I wonder what, it, what it's there for. I think it's more the system for the, okay. for the it's the, because it's the same as in the admissions one, which would correspond to the application fee. But there are absolutely no fee to apply for financial aid. Mm. Okay, so it's probably a reminiscence of something we don't need. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it would stop at the supporting documents because okay. we don't ask any additional items or any additional uh, things on top of the supporting documents. Cool. Okay, great. Well, that was uh, sharing the screen. Yes. That was a lot. <laughs> That was a lot, but it's it's good. I think we gave all the detail we could think of. Um, it should be very helpful to some students. I feel like they can be watching that while actually applying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I do have one last question that um, I also get a lot on the tours. Um, so once you submit your general application, what can you anticipate? Like, what's the application going to go through? When are you going to hear back? Things like that. Yeah. So we review applications in rounds. So we have different rounds, different deadlines. So also the question that I'm sure you get a lot is, oh, what's your deadline to apply? Mm -hmm. and Am I too late? <laughs> and then I say, oh, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have multiple deadlines, let's say. 
so we had a, a early kind of early early action um, application in uh, November 15th. It's very early, but uh, that's kind of fairly standard in the US and students apply that early. Um, then we had our deadlines yesterday, our next deadlines prior to admissions February um, first. Yeah. Oh no, we're February 15 too. Now I'm getting confused with all deadlines because <laughs> what matters is you can apply at any point. Okay, so if you miss the deadline, you don't have to wait the next deadline to submit your application. You don't have to take the next one in March. You don't have to wait March. You can submit it when it's complete, um, mm -hmm. but it helps students to have deadlines because you can group your applications um, if you're applying to other schools. Kind of, it's fairly standard deadlines for rolling admissions. So you're like, okay, this is when I'm going to apply to all of my schools. Mm -hmm. um, but you can apply at any time. I say it's best to take more time to write your essay, do some more proofreading, have people read your essay mm -hmm. and give you advice. Um, then just rush to submit it by the deadline. At least at EUP, that's how we work. Um, once it's complete, it will go in our applied file and our application reading team will get to work and, and read them. So the turn around on applications, it can be quite fast. Right now, it's the moment where we get a lot of applications. So we usually say you hear back within three weeks, but um, when it's kind of the main deadline, Mm -hmm. It might be a slightly a bit, a bit more because that's where we get um, a lot of applications. But usually it's pretty fast when we have all of the documents. Um, and yeah, so they go to our application team. And then once you are admitted, um, you kind of come back to your admissions counselor. So um, I will get, you know, all the students that were admitted that I'm responsible for. And then you start getting in touch with your counselor about confirming your place, or if you have more questions or applying for financial aid, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a good last thing to note that if <laughs> you have any questions about the uh, application or maybe you wanna change something like I did with my SAT scores, <laughs> um, you can always contact the admissions counselor that you're assigned to. Exactly, and if you don't know who you're assigned to, you email admissions, admissions at ap.edu. Um, with like your name and where you're from uh, and you know if you're in the U.S. what state as well so we can connect you to the person because we have a team in the U.S. as well helping U.S. students mm -hmm. so they're on the right time zone. Yeah BDBU were mine as a French student mm -hmm. even I if I was transferring from the states you, you were you were my counselor. Yes we go because we go by address by current address and I think at that time you were back in France. Yeah I was. So, yeah it's by location um, or location of school, you know, if you're, if you're go to boarding school. Um, so yeah, as your counselor. Uh, so I, for example, I'm responsible for students in France, Monaco, Luxembourg, Thailand, Singapore, UAE, Qatar, and some other places. Uh, Tim has other countries, Latin America, etc. So we each have our own kind of territories. So we get to know our students very well, which is what I like. Like Tim said at the beginning, we read all the applications from not an algorithm, and, and I like it. I know the students by name, um, mm -hmm. not just their numbers, so which sometimes they found very tricky when I can <laughs> call them by their names and like quote something from their <laughs> But I do, I do read their applications after the fact to get to know them. And I think it's a, it's a good mirror of how the school is mm -hmm. because once you are guys at AUP, it's the same every, I mean, not everybody knows everybody, obviously, because we still kind of like a bit, but a lot of people know a lot of people and you're going to get to know your professor really well too. So they're going to call you by your first name and they're going to remember that they had you in class the semester before and things like that. So it's definitely the admission or, or already reflect what AUP yeah. is. Um, yeah. Like a small community that, like everybody knows each other. <laughs> yes, and please call us by our first names. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I get Madame Fouché a lot, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm too young for that. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's it's a nice uh, personalized approach for a small team, which mm -hmm. is uh, which is nice. That's what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Alrighty. Well, thank I you. That's so a wrap up. 
yeah, I think so. Thank you so much for joining us on this um, this tour of the application, if you will. <laughs> it's literally a tour. We literally yeah. took it. That's a good, good title for it. Oh, I, I'll, I'll tell Lisa. Maybe we'll put that in the title. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And um, yeah, any questions, they can email admissions at aup.edu. Yeah, exactly. They also can join us next week for a live uh, Wireless Wednesday. So if you want to join and ask questions about what we talked today, um, you are more than welcome to join us. Uh, it might be Elena and I, it might be other students. We haven't decided yet who will be hosting, but you'll find definitely students there to uh, answer your questions. And so it's going to be live? It's going to be live, yes. Cool. Every cool. other week, is it, it will be a live Q&A. Mm -hmm. So you can ask this question that are burning you right now while you are listening to us and be like, okay, I'll take notes and I'll go next week. <laughs> are you less ready? Yeah, exactly. They're going to fire those questions at us. We're going to be like, oh my God. <laughs> I think you're ready. I think you're ready. You've, you've done a great job and you've been doing tours for a long time now. Not this past year, but you, you know. Yeah, they think you you. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thank you so much again for joining us and have a good evening or day or whatever time it is. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.